All right, good evening, everyone. Could you turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16? 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. You, uh, you should have my translation of chapter 4 in front of you, or 2 Timothy chapter 4 in front of you, and open to that verse. Uh, we're going to uh, finish off verse 17 here this evening, and as promised last evening, we're going to note that last statement uh, that Paul makes in verse 17, that he was rescued out of the lion's mouth. As I said before, we need to take a... Uh, take a, uh, an evening looking just at that statement because it's a, 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 a difficult one to interpret. And we have to consider and look at uh, several different interpretations. I'm going to show you why, uh, without a doubt, which one's the, the, the best interpretation. And you'll see that, uh, um, you'll see that, see that here this evening is my prayer that you'll see what I'm saying here. I think it's pretty obvious what Paul is alluding to when he makes this reference here to the lion's mouth in verse 17, being delivered or rescued out of the lion's mouth. So uh, remember, we have our, our prayer meeting at the end of uh, class uh, here this evening. And uh, let's take a moment of silent prayer. Let's get, our, get rolling here. Let's take a moment of silent prayer to examine ourselves this evening. If we need to confess any sins to the Father, the confession of sin restores our fellowship with God and simultaneously the filling of the Spirit because uh, if we're doing what 1 John 1, 9 states, which the Holy Spirit is inspired like the rest of the Scripture, we're being influenced by the Holy Spirit. That's what the filling of the Spirit in Ephesians 5.18 is all about. So if there's anything that's bothering you, disturbing or distracting to you, uh, do what 1 Peter 5.7 says, cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because He cares for you. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've graciously given to us. We thank you for another day to study your word. We thank you for another week of classes and our study in 2 Timothy. We pray that you would continue to bless us in this study. We pray there would be a blessing to your people and also bring glory to you and your son, Jesus Christ, as we apply what we're learning in this book. We pray that you would help everyone in the audience to understand by the power of the Spirit and to apply what they're learning to understand and make application. Help them to concentrate. We pray that the message would take fr uh, uh, bear fruit in their lives, that would take root in their hearts, and that you, it would continue to be watered with the Word. Uh, we just pray, Father, that you would empower me as the communicator to communicate and interpret accurately your Word so that your people are built up and edified spiritually and so that all of us can continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, we pray, Father, for Titus and Tyler with the sound of the recordings. We thank you for the service and the technology that you've given to us and those uh, who are listening uh, live on the website or at a later date through the recordings on the website. And also, of course, we thank you for those who are here in the Thompson household. We thank you for Titus and Jody Thompson opening up their home to us and their sacrifice opening up their home to us uh, four days so we can teach four days a week. We just thank you so much uh, for their sacrifice and service. And we just pray, Father, for this uh, particular service this evening, that it would be a great blessing again to you people and bring glory to you and your Son. In our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, name we pray. Amen. You should be at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. I'm going to read verses 16 and 17 from the New American Standard and then go right over to reading my translation. There's really not much... Uh, to uh, the only uh, uh, the Greek of the uh, the translation of the New American Standard, that in that last statement where Paul says, "I was rescued out of the lion's mouth," uh, it's a good translation, pretty much what I have. And so, uh, therefore, uh, since we covered uh, verse 17, a good portion of it last evening, and the language there in the original text, uh, uh, there's no need to go through any Greek here this evening. So, it says in 2 Timothy 4.16, At my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me, a reference to Christians who deserted Paul. May it not be counted against them, that's a reference to forgiving them. But the Lord stood with me, faithfulness of God there, and strengthened me, so that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was rescued out of 
the lion's mouth. Now, my translation of those exact same verses goes as follows. During my first defense to protect themselves, no one stood for me, but on the contrary, the majority deserted me. May it not be held against them. However, the Lord provided assistance to me. Specifically, he empowered me so that through me the proclamation was proclaimed to everyone. Namely, each and every one of the Gentiles heard the proclamation. And I was also rescued from the lion's mouth. As we're going to see this evening, that very last statement is going to be a reference to the Lord temporarily rescuing Paul from capital punishment. That's what it's actually referring to. Uh, we go further uh, and we look at verse 18 next week, we're going to see he's actually talking about the fact that he'll be delivered with, uh, by the Lord uh, upon his death because he'll be absent from the body face to face with the Lord and Nero's attempt to actually uh, wipe uh, Paul's existence, uh, Paul out of existence will have failed because of course, like all believers, Paul went right into the presence of Christ at their physical death. So after informing, informing Timothy that the Lord Jesus Christ empowered him to proclaim the gospel to every non-Christian present during his first defense before the Roman authorities, Paul presents an additional way the Lord empowered him. Namely, he empowered Paul by delivering him from the lion's mouth. And so the difficulty with this statement here, that he was delivered from the lion's mouth, there's a difficulty with this statement, and, it, and the, uh, it, there's a difficult, difficulty with this statement, and it lies in the problem of who or what Paul is speaking of when he uses the expression, the lion's mouth. In the Greek, it's the word stomatos, laontos, and it's translated lion's mouth. So what is, who is it referring to, and, or what is it referring to? What is he referring to when he uses this expression? Some have interpreted this expression to be a medical, metaphorical reference to Nero, who was the emperor at that time, or some uh, interpret this to be a literal reference to the lion's den in the Roman Colosseum, which uh, was used to kill Christians. Uh, very uh, historically, we know that to be the case. Other commentators believe that Paul is drawing on a biblical image that appears in Psalm 22, verse 21 in your Bibles, in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, it's verse, uh, 20, uh, chapter 21, uh, verse 21. Or uh, they reference Daniel 6.22 to support the interpretation that Paul is drawing on a biblical image that appears in Daniel 6.22 in Psalm 22, verse 21. Now, the passage in Daniel which we study speaks of the Lord delivering Daniel from literal lions, whereas the former, Psalm 22, verse 21, is a proverbial saying referring to great danger which is caused by one's enemies. Now, some expositors, some interpreters of the Bible, they believe the lion is also, uh, could be a reference to Satan. And they use 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, as support for this interpretation, because Saint, Satan is a threat to the Christian, is described as, uh, uh, you know, like, uh, described in a way that, uh, of a lion uh, opening its mouth to devour its prey. Now, the interpretation that Paul is referring to literal, literal lions cannot be correct. Let's go through each of these interpretations. In fact, let's go back a little bit and just uh, summarize again the various interpretations of uh, this phrase, the lion's mouth, because Paul says he was rescued out of the lion's mouth. Who or what is Paul referring to? Well, one interpretation has the lion's mouth as a reference, as a metaphor, metaphorical reference to Nero. Some have it as a literal reference to the lions in the Roman Colosseum that were used to kill Christians. Other commentators believe that Paul's drawing on a biblical image that appears in Psalm 22, verse 21, and Daniel 6, 22. But, so uh, the latter, saw Daniel chapter 6, verse 22, speaks of the Lord delivering Daniel from literal lions, whereas the passage in Psalm 22 is a proverbial saying referring to great danger which co was caused by one's enemies. So let's break down, uh, the other one, by the way, I almost forgot that, the other one is, the, some uh, refer to the lion's mouth as a reference to being delivered from Satan, because in 1 Peter 5, 8, uh, remember uh, Paul, Paul said, uh, Peter describes uh, Satan as uh, like a lion roaring, uh, looking to devour somebody. So they, they think it's 1 Peter 5, 8, is, they use 1 Peter 5, 8 as support for this interpretation uh, of the lion's mouth being Satan. So let's break down each of these. If, if you really take your time looking at these, the only one really could make any sense. The interpretation that Paul is referring to literal lions, literal lions cannot be correct. 
and, and because historically we know that the Roman Empire did not employ this form of capital punishment with Roman citizens who were beheaded. Now, you should know that because I've mentioned that Paul's a Roman citizen. And they didn't, they didn't execute Roman citizens, uh, capital punishment, with, by giving them over to the lions. Uh, nor did they uh, crucify Roman citizens like Paul was. They would behead them. It's more humane, obviously. They thought, cap, uh, they thought uh, crucifixion was the worst type of punishment and only should be uh, uh, relegated to the worst enemies of the state. So it cannot be referring to literal lions here. Uh, because historically we know that the Roman Empire did not employ this form of capital punishment with Roman citizens, and Roman citizens were beheaded. Now, thus the interpretation that Paul is drawing on the biblical imagery in Daniel uh, chapter 6, verse 22, could not be correct as well, because Daniel was, literal lions were involved there. So that interpretation uh, cannot be true, the, that the, the reference is to literal lions. The interpretation that the lion is a reference to Satan is also incorrect for the simple reason is that if this were the case, the word for lion there, leon, it would be articular. There would be a definite article in the Greek in front of it rather than having no article, which we call in Greek grammar, anathras. Why? Because an articular word, would you, would, if we use the uh, leon and have it, uh, leon, excuse me, lion, in the Greek, if we wanted to have it a reference to Satan, the, you would, a Greek-speaking person would put the article in front of it to make it as, someone, as, as a person, make it a substantive, and make it someone who's well-known to the reader. So we don't have that. It has no article. That's described, we call that in Greek grammar, anathras, when it doesn't have an article. So if it was a person involved, you would see the article in the original text. And the article would indicate that this, uh, this is a particular uh, lion is well known to the reader. Uh, not putting it, an article in front of it is, it, it, it would not be, it's, it's, it's clearly he's not talking about a person. So if Satan's obviously a person, you would expect the article to be before this particular uh, word, leon, lion. Now we have the same problem. We have the same problem with interpreting the lion as a metaphorical reference to Nero. Because if, if, he, if this was a reference to uh, Nero, uh, there would be an article as well in front of this word leon. And uh, of course, we don't have that. Paul's not using uh, an articular construction. So this leads us to the best interpretation, and we get support. Uh, because Paul is actually, as, as we all know, Paul was steeped in his Old Testament he was a great old, he's the greatest Old Testament scholar, obviously, in the church. And he, he's actually, like most of the church, uh, like uh, Peter and, um, and Paul would do, and John, they were, when they went teaching to the Gentiles, they would t the Gentiles were not Hebrew-speaking people. They would take the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, and they would use that as their Old Testament translation. All right? So they would use that, and uh, in fact, many of the Jews of Paul's day spoke Greek and didn't, uh, didn't, uh, did no longer maintain the Hebrew mother tongue because of the dispersions in Assyria and Babylon. They came back, and a lot of them had uh, been Helen. Uh, they eventually were Hellenized. Uh, the they uh, became Greek speaking, and a lot of them did not, unless you were a rabbi uh, or some kind of teacher, you didn't no long, you know, you didn't learn Hebrew. And though they spoke Hebrew in the synagogues, but some synagogues, they, they used the Septuagint if the people were, all the Jews were, you know, Greek speaking in their synagogue. So what we have is Paul's actually quoting, he's alluding to a passage in Psalm 22, which is in your English Bibles, in, in the Septuagint, it's Psalm 21. So the best interpretation, as we'll see, is that Paul is quoting Psalm 21, verse 22, in the Septuagint translation, which in our English Bibles would be Psalm 22, verse 21. What's the Septuagint? Quick background, we've seen this in the past. It's the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. It came about because in around 300 BC in Alexandria with uh, some rabbis. Uh, they, 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 the, the Jews, because they, of the dispersions and the, the Hellenization of the Jews and, and Palestine by Alexander the Great and his, great and his Greek Empire, uh, the, the Jews no longer spoke Hebrew, most of them, except for the rabbis. And, and so what they would do 
is that they would they needed a translation in Greek because everybody was speaking Greek at that point. So that's why it came about. And the new and if you uh, we've studied this with Paul and Romans, the apostles used the Septuagint. Uh, they used they quoted from it. We know it. Uh, they sometimes quote, quoted it from it verbatim. Sometimes they quoted uh, a lot of it, and then some parts they would change. Like Paul would change because he had a better translation than the Septuagint translation had for certain Hebrew words. So this is what we have going on here. So that shouldn't be a problem with uh, inspiration or inerrancy or what, because the, the apostles were inspired when they wrote the New Testament. Those uh, writers of the New Testament, they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. So if the highest Holy Spirit had him quote the Septuagint, that's okay. Because the Holy Spirit is the one who is directing the human authors of Scripture to use whatever materials that they use. Uh, in fact, we see Paul quoting from uh, obscure Greek prophets and in, in Titus. So, it, uh, the, so the, the, don't be uh, sidetracked by the fact that the apostles would quote from the Septuagint. And the Septuagint was not inspired by God at all, but that doesn't mean that the translation was, uh, we know it's not perfect, was inspired by God, but it doesn't mean it was terrible. Uh, in fact, we use the Septuagint quite a bit to help us understand the New Testament. So the, what here is that if the Holy Spirit is guiding, like Paul, to quote from the Septuagint or Peter, that's, that's fine. Because the Holy Spirit would know the best, right? So the Holy Spirit will, uh, is obviously knows what the, uh, it's okay to use certain portions of the Septuagint. So anyways, we have the best interpretation is that Paul is quoting from Psalm 21, verse 22 in the Septuagint translation, which in our English Bibles is Psalm 22, verse 21. This psalm, use, uh, this psalm uses deliverance from the lion's mouth as a metaphorical reference to being saved or delivered from capital punishment. Don't miss that. Paul's using, alluding to Psalm 22, verse 21 and that psalm is using, this psalm uses deliverance from the lion's mouth as a metaphorical reference to being saved or delivered from capital punishment. Now, the Septuagint translation of Psalm 22, verse 21, which is Soson me ek stomatos leontos, and Paul's Greek text in 2 Timothy 4.17 has era rustain uh, ek stomatos leontos. And there's a little bit of difference in the words that he's using. Uh, if you know, uh, uh, just, you don't know, you're not Greek speaking or you don't know Greek, in front of me, unless you're uh, listening to me and you're studying Greek or you're a pastor or you're, you're some kind of scholar that knows the Greek text. If you notice, and both, the, the, both contain the same prepositional phrase, ek stomatos leontos. They both have that same prepositional phrase. The only difference are that the only differences are that Paul uses the verb oruomai, while the Septuagint uses another word which expresses the idea of deliverance from danger, namely sozo. So Paul, does, but sozo and oruomai can almost be interchangeable. They all have, they both have to speak of deliverance and salvation. So the Septuagint also employs meh, which refers to the psalmist, while Paul does not use this word. Furthermore, the verb sozo is used in the future tense, whereas Paul uses the aorist tense of eruomai. However, Paul does use the future tense of sozo as well as the future tense of the verb eruomai in 2 Timothy 4.18 when speaking of his future deliverance from physical death when he will be absent from the body but face to face with the Lord. If you look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 18. Let me get there. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 18. The Lord will rescue me. Okay? Right there, he's using, uh, uh, he's using uh, the future tense of Eruamai there. So he says, but the Lord, will, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely, sozo, to his heavenly kingdom, to him be the glory forever and ever, amen. So what's interesting is that sozo and eruamai are both used interchangeably in Psalm 22. Psalm 21 in the Septuagint. And that's what Paul is doing in verses 17 and 18. So, and the passage in Psalm is a metaphorical reference from being delivered from capital punishment. And what is Paul talking about? Deliverance from capital punishment. So, uh, temporarily, of course, eventually he got executed. So the Septuagint 
alternates, as I said before, this verb eruamai and the other verb sozo in Psalm 21 verses 5 and 6 in your English Bibles, that's Psalm 22 verses 4 and 5. And in Psalm 21 9 as well, in, in your English Bibles, that's Psalm 22 verse 8. And Psalm 21 verses 21 and 22, which is in our English Bibles is Psalm 22 verses 20 and 21. So this alternating pattern that is between these two words, eruamai and uh, sozo, is found in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. So that's very, very, very important. So this very strongly suggests that Paul, in 2 Timothy 4, 17 and 18, is alluding to this psalm, Psalm 21 in the Septuagint, in your English Bibles, Psalm 22. Now, the alternating pattern, he uses it in, these, in verses 17 and 18. That's how it's used in the psalm. So that's telling us that Paul is picking up on this, and this is indicating to us he's using this psalm. And what is he speaking in the context of? Being delivered from Nero. Capital punishment, actually. Not Nero. Capital punishment. The psalmist was saying that too. So Paul picked up on this psalm with the interchange of Sozo and Aruamai, and the, 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 that it was speaking of metaphorical reference of being delivered from capital punishment, and Paul picked right up on it and used the psalm. That's why he used it. So in this psalm, Psalm 22 in your English Bibles, the psalmist states that friends have de deserted him as well. That's inter interesting. Because that corresponds to Paul's situation in which he informs Timothy in 2 Timothy 4.16 that no one in the Christian community stood up for him during his first defense before the Roman authorities. So therefore, since Paul is alluding to Psalm 21 in the Septuagint and deliverance from the lion's mouth, and Psalm 21, verse 21, is a reference to deliverance from a violent physical death. Deliverance from the lion's mouth and 2 Timothy 4, 17 must refer to the same thing. Let me repeat that. Therefore, since Paul is alluding to Psalm 21 in the Septuagint, and deliverance from the lion's mouth and Psalm 21, verse 21, is a reference to deliverance from a violent physical death. Deliverance from the lion's mouth and 2 Timothy 4, 17 must refer to to the same thing. So, let's take a look at Psalm 22. Hold your place. Look at Psalm 22. Look at Psalm 22, verse 1. Now, very first verse, very first verse quoted by Jesus. If you notice, look at Psalm 22, verse 1. Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I have no rest. Yet you are holy, O oh you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. Remember, Jesus quoted from the verse, very first verse. Look at verse 4. In your fathers, in, our, in you, our fathers trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. You delivered them. And that's, a, uh, and that's a sozo is used there for the word for deliverer. They, uh, they, tr uh, you, they trusted you and delivered you. To you, they cried out and were delivered. And you, they trusted and were not disappointed. But I am a worm and not a man, a reproach of men, despised by the people. And that Jesus was the fulfillment of that. All who see me sneer at me. They separate with a lip. They wag their head saying, commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him because he delights in him. Of course, that was fulfilled with Jesus on the cross. Yet you are he who brought me forth from the womb. You made me trust when upon my mother's breast. Upon you I was cast from birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. But not far from me, for trouble is near. For there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They open wide their mouth at me as a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a postured, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws, and you lay me in the dust of, the de of, of death. For dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers has encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. That was fulfilled with Jesus on the cross as well. 
I can count all my bones. They look and they stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. That was fulfilled in Jesus' crucifixion. But you, O Lord, be not far off. O you, my help, hasten to my assistance. Deliver my soul from the sword, my only life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth. Remember, Paul is alluding to this, he's, he's referencing this in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. Save me from the lion's mouth. See? What does he say in 2 Timothy 4, 17? The very statement, the Lord rescued me, from the, uh, rescued me from the lion's mouth. Paul's thinking of that verse. Save me from the lion's mouth. From the horns of the wild oxen, you answer me. I will tell of your name to, to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will praise you. So, uh, there we have... Uh, Paul, uh, we'll stop at that particular portion. A lot of this was fulfilled with uh, Jesus, of course. Does that mean that Paul can't quote from it? No. He's, he's referencing Psalm 22, verse 21. Save me from the lion's mouth, and the Lord did. So in that passage, uh, there's, a lot of, there's a couple of things going on here. It was fulfilled in David's day. The, who, who wrote the psalm? It's a cry of anguish, and it was a psalm of David. Now, this is something, Titus actually uh, asked me a question after about Matthew 10 last night. And he made a, re he, he was saying, you know, oh, the very end of that, uh, very end of that quote, I didn't read all the way through. Oh, I did actually read all the way through. But there's actually a reference to um, the tribulation period. It's actually an ultimate fulfillment will be during the tribulation. It wasn't just fulfilled in, in the apostles' day, as Acts records, it'll find its ultimate fulfillment, that prophecy that Jesus, in Matthew 10, that it'll find its ultimate fulfillment with the Jews and the tribulation period. So what we're going to see in Zephaniah, is, and we saw this in Daniel, is that in prophecy, you can have what we call a near fulfillment, fulfillment meaning the psalmist gives a, a psalm, and it's fulfilled in his time, or very soon after. David is writing a psalm, and that psalm was fulfilled in his day. He wrote this, and it was fulfilled of himself. Okay? Then uh, we have a, a, a far fulfillment where we have J uh, Jesus here in Psalm 22 fulfills a great portion of this Psalm 22. Like, my, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The piercing of the hands and the feet. So they're all talking about, in that reference, it ult finds its ultimate fulfillment and the Lord Jesus Christ, all right? And the same thing with uh, in the, uh, the prophecy of uh, Matthew 10 that we read last evening. It, it was fulfilled because uh, in Paul's day, a good portion of it, there was a, a near fulfillment, near to the writer, uh, and so uh, you know, near to the, uh, when Jesus made that prophecy, but it finds its ultimate or far fulfillment with the tribulation Jews uh, who are going to be persecuted by Antichrist. So, what we have here is that, uh, that Paul, he just takes a portion of this psalm because he's, he has a situation where he was temporarily delivered from execution. At, and so uh, here in Psalm 22 is a metaphorical reference from being delivered from death, a violent death, capital punishment. And so that's what Paul is alluding to this psalm and quoting Psalm 22, verse 21, because that's why he uses the phrase, the Lord rescued me from the lion's mouth. So you can see that he is actually alluding to this psalm, Psalm 22, in that particular, that verse. And that makes sense because in 2 Timothy 4, 17 and 18, he uses interchangeably, like Psalm 22 does, two, in the Septuagint, two Greek verbs, sozo and aruamai, both speak of being delivered or saved from something. So, and they're used interchangeably there. So... Paul, that, that tells and Paul's using those two words interchangeably in 2 Timothy 4, 17 and 18. That's a dead giveaway of very strong evidence, I sh we should say, that he's referring to this psalm. And therefore, when he says, I was rescued from the lion's mouth, it's a, a metaphorical, ref he's speaking of being delivered temporarily from capital punishment. That's what it's referring to. Doesn't speak of Nero, because the word leon, Lion in 2 Timothy 4.17 would have an article in front of it. Doesn't speak of Satan. It would have an article in front of it. Because if you want to talk about a person, you, you would t put, the noun, uh, put an article before the noun indicating it's a well-known person to the reader. It doesn't, feel, it doesn't refer to literal lions because they didn't use lions to execute Roman citizens. Paul's, Paul was a Roman citizen. 
So it's got to be allusion to Psalm 22. I think the evidence is pretty, pretty heavily in favor of that interpretation. So go back now to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 17. Now in 2 Timothy 4, 6, Paul stated that his death was soon to take place. Therefore, when Paul speaks of deliverance from the lion's mouth in 2 Timothy 4.17, he is speaking in metaphorical terms of being temporarily delivered from capital punishment, while at the same time knowing that he will eventually be executed. Then, as we read in 2 Timothy 4.18, he states that the Lord will rescue him ultimately from this physical death by bringing him safely to his kingdom. So the reference being brought safely to God's kingdom is talking about he's going to die. He knows eventually he's going to die. This is temporarily deli being delivered from physical death, capital punishment. Ultimately, he's going to get executed. He knows that. So probably what happened is they gave the, they, he stood in his first defense. They found him guilty, but they haven't sentenced him yet. So you're going to come back for that, or they, uh, they maybe, you know, they decided to, they put it off for whatever reasons. So that's what we have here is that uh, in 2 Timothy 4.18, he's talking about being ultimately delivered uh, through physical, de uh, physical death by the Lord and being uh, delivered from physical death and being absent from the body, but face to face with the Lord. Nero could kill his body or order the execution and the death of his, you know, killing it off the body. But Paul will continue to exist and he'll be absent from the body face to face with the Lord. So 2 Timothy 4.17, when he says, the Lord rescued me from the lion's mouth, it's a, talking about a temporary deliverance from a violent physical death or temporary deliverance from capital punishment. Paul learned through personal experiences in ministry that the Lord Jesus Christ is a God of deliverance. And absolutely, I can say amen to that. My personal experience is he is certainly that. He learned, Paul learned through experience, that Jesus Christ not only delivers the sinner from sin, Satan, spiritual death, and eternal condemnation, but also physical danger and even physical death. As in the case of Paul, God frequently rescues people from danger, suffering, and sin through human agency. There's no deliverance with the pagan gods. And there's no escape from God. In Scripture, the Bible teaches that God is a God of deliverance. He not, not only deliverance, delivers us from sin, Satan, eternal condemnation, physical and spiritual death, he delivers us from physical danger too at times and physical death. So just think about that. If we're not the rapture generation, we all die a natural death or whatever, how we die. We're going to experience that deliverance from physical death because the minute you die physically, you're absent from the body, face to face with the Lord. Second, was it second uh, Corinthians chapter five, verse eight, right? You're going to get a resurrection body. They can kill these bodies, and do, these bodies can die and ever decompose, but you're going to get a resurrection body. You're going to have the victory. You're going to have deliverance from death, physical death, the greatest enemy. So that will be the last enemy is put, is, it will be done away with, with the new heavens and the new earth. So now we know what the text says, what Paul's saying in that last statement in 2 Timothy 4.17. Theologically, what can we gather from it? God is a God of deliverance. God is a God of deliverance, not from spiritual, just simply from spiritual matters, but we also forget he can deliver us from physical danger and physical death. Uh, didn't we study that in Daniel? Daniel with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel chapter 3, Daniel chapter 6, he was executed, thrown in the lion's den. All of them, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were delivered from fire. They were going to be, you know, the soldiers who were using, used to execute him died, but they didn't get touched. Does God, can God do that today? Absolutely. He can do that. He can do that. I, I'm, I'm sure he's done that since those, that t those days. God is a God of deliverance. He's deliverance from, he can deliver us from death, physical danger. I know, for, I know that I mean, he may not do it in a dramatic sense and, you know, uh, but I know I've been delivered from situations where I, should, I could have died very easily in a car crash or something, different things that have happened. And, and I, I was spared. Now, he didn't, you know, he didn't, I didn't see an angel, visible angel, you know, and, you know, like in Daniel, uh, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. But God doesn't need to have a, a, make an angel visible to me to, uh, to uh, you know, to deliver me. You know, they're, they're invisible to us, the angels. And, 
you know, God can deliver us. We, we might be, find out when we get to heaven how many times he did deliver us from physical death or physical danger. We weren't even aware of it. You know, so God is a God of deliverance. Uh, in scripture, there are different kinds of deliverance. There's deliverance from danger. There's deliverance from illness, deliverance from trouble, uh, deliverance from slavery. Remember the Exodus generation? And uh, there's, de excuse me, there's deliverance from enemies, like in Jeremiah 38 and Daniel chapter 6 and Luke 174 and 2 Thessalonians 3, 2, which we read last evening. There's deliverance from Satan, uh, we know that, uh, that uh, God delivers us from Satan. There's also deliverance from the fear of death, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. There's also deliverance from all of our fears. God can deliver us from all of our fears. He can deliver us, of course, and has delivered us from sin. Uh, when Christ died on the cross, he dealt with our sin problem, and then I, he identified us with Christ in his crucifixion, death, and burial, and resurrection, and session, the right hand of the Father through the baptism of the Spirit at our conversion, which gives us the victory over sin. It delivers us from sin and Satan, this identification with Christ. And we appropriate that deliverance by exercising faith in what God's word says and considering ourselves dead to the sin nature and alive to God. So we're delivered from sin, we're delivered from Satan, we're delivered from the coming wrath. We're delivered from eternal condemnation. And the church has been delivered from the tribulation period of Daniel's 70th week, which is the last three and a half years of that seven-year period. God promises his people deliverance. Psalm 50, uh, Jeremiah 15, 11 and Daniel 12, 1. His people are to pray for deliverance at times. Matthew 6, 13. You can compare that with 2 Kings 19, 19, or Isaiah 37, 20, and Psalm 59, verses 1 and 2. God delivers through means. Uh, he can use, he can be directly intervene. He can uh, directly intervene like he did with the Exodus generation and Pharaoh in Egypt. Uh, Exodus 14, 13, we studied that book. 2 Kings 7, 6. God can use angels. He can use angels to deliver. Remember when Peter was arrested and an angel came and got him out of there and got the, ch the chains fell off him, walked right out of the, pr the prison and uh, he walked right back to uh, the house and the, and the slave girl thought it was, a, you know, couldn't believe it was him, left him at the door. <laughs> Funny scene, and you know, Paul, uh, Peter was delivered from uh, death there. In fact, let's take a little peek at that. Look at Acts chapter 12. It's a funny story, too, to boot. The girl's uh, actions are funny. Look at uh, Acts chapter 12, verse 1. Because uh, Peter was more than likely going to get executed. Look at Acts chapter 12, verse 1, please. Acts chapter 12, verse 1, now about that time, Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. That means he executed him. When he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. What do you think his intention was? Kill Peter too, like he did James, John's brother. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. When he had seized him, Peter, he put him in prison, Herod did, delivering him to four squads of soldiers. And why, is the, why is Luke putting that in there about the, how many soldiers were there? To magnify the great deliverance that takes place. Four squads of soldiers. These are tough, hardened Roman soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out before the people. So Peter was kept in the prison, but prayer for him was being made fervently by the church of God. On the very night when Herod was about to bring him forward, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and guards in front of the door were watching over the prison. So he can't, humanly, it's, in, it's not humanly possible to escape. He is surrounded. He's, ch two sol he's chained between two soldiers. There's soldiers in the, in the front of the thing. He, he's surrounded. So that's the right. Luke's trying to make you understand this was a supernatural deliverance. This was not a human deliverance that happened to Peter. There's no way humanly possible he's getting by this out of this situation when he's changed all these guards. And behold, verse 7, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared and a light shone in the cell. And he struck Peter's side, I always like that, and woke him up saying, get up quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. 
Uh, Houdini couldn't do that, something like that. And the angel said to him, gird yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out. Why does he have to tell Peter this? Because Peter's obviously stunned. I mean, have you ever been delivered by an angel who shows up at your you know, prison cell? I mean, he has to be told all these things because he's in shock. Or he probably thinks he's in a dream. Right? That's what he ends up saying. So he went out, verse 9, and continued to follow. And he did not know that what was being done by the angel was real. But thought he was seeing a vision. <laughs> he didn't really, this is not really happening. Well, it was. When they had passed the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate. That must have been cool. Dum -dum -dum -dum, and nobody sees me. So he, when they had passed the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened for them by itself. <laughs> I think it's one of the coolest passages in the Bible. That's pretty cool. Talk about power. And they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. When Peter came to himself, he said, now I know for sure that the Lord has sent forth his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod. There we go. Rescued me. Deliverance. From all that the Jewish people were expecting. And when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying for him. When he knocked at the door of the gate, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter was standing in front of the gate. They said to her, you are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. They kept saying, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had led him out of the prison, and he said, report these things to James and the brethren, and then, the, then he left and went to another place and of course then it goes on to say when they when day came there was no small disturbance meaning that's a figure for it was a huge disturbance no now when, when the day came there was no small disturbance among the soldiers as the what could have become a peter <laughs> can you imagine trying to tell herod what happened you mean to tell me you were you he was chained between the two of you he you had guys in front you had how did this guy walk out in the gates go through the gate how did that happen you guys are a dereliction of duty, right? That's the first thing if you were Herod, natural-minded man. There's no way they'd get out of here. That's what happened. When Herod searched for him and had not found him, he examined the guards in order that they be led away to execution. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and was spending time there. And then Herod died after that. So there's a del great deliverance. Peter was delivering, and he learned through experience like Paul that the Lord can uh, deliver from physical danger and capital punishment. Peter was uh, going to be delivered from, ca was delivered from capital punishment, no doubt, uh, by that, in that situation as we just saw. So there's, God can directly intervene himself, or he can use angels, as the case with Peter. He can also, there can also be, God can deliver people uh, with other human beings. He can use other human beings to deliver us. Uh, from situations. Now, the Word of God presents God's people as deliverers. Interestingly enough, Abraham is, is described as a deliverer uh, of God's people. Moses was used by God to deliver the Jewish people from the uh, slavery to Egypt. Joshua is described as a deliverer. And the judges, if you see the book of Judges, the judges, the various judges like Samson, guys like that in Gideon, they were in Barak, they were all individuals who were described as deliverers of some sort, sent by God to deliver the nation of Israel from type, some type of adversity or, or uh, through, and, uh, or, or, you know, military people, uh, they were being overrun militarily and the, God raises up a guy who could fight and he delivers the nation of Israel. Uh, also, Samuel is described as a deliverer in scripture. So was Saul uh, in First uh, Samuel chapter 11, verses 9 through 13. Uh, the, that early on in his, uh, his uh, reign. Jonathan is described as one. David, of course, is described as a deliverer of God's people in 2 Samuel 8, 1 and 14. And of course, the Lord Jesus Christ, the God-man, is our deliverer. He's our savior. Those who are delivered by God through various these various means are to respond appropriately with praise. So when God delivers you from a, a terrible adversity or death, physical death, uh, whatnot, uh, where our response should be of one of worship and praise. Uh, there's praise, there's delight, there's thanksgiving, of course. 
uh, you should always, and you talk about prayer, one of the things you should always add to your prayer list is thank God for all the deliverances that God has given you from all your sicknesses, illnesses, and diseases, and bad decisions, and undeserved suffering. That's what I do. Thank, because you've been delivered from a lot. If you think about your life, you'll have to admit, if you've been if living for any length of time, if you're my age, and you're in your 50s, as a Christian, you've been walking with the Lord for a while, God has delivered you in a lot of ways. Think back and thank God for it. Also, uh, we're to, this should cause us to have more faith in God. When God delivers us from physical danger or physical death, we should grow to trust him more. And also, we should become more obedient, thankful, and then show that thanksgiving by being more and more obedient to him for the things he has done for us, the great deliverances that he has given to us. So uh, I know for myself, in my, in my ministry, in my life as, as a Christian, and even before I became a Christian, God delivered me from many situations where, which could have uh, been very bad for me, whether it could have been a bad, uh, you know, uh, bad uh, crippled in a car accident, or, you know, it could have gone either way. You look at people who die, you know, like when I was a kid, I remember when I was 16 years old, and, uh, no, I was a teen, I was 18 and 19, I remember these 16-year-old kids, they all died in a car accident. Now, I remember they were all up in, right not too far from where I live, and they, the car hit a wall. It was, they would think we're dragging somebody else, we believe. And it hit the wall, our neighbor's wall, and went right into the tree like a pancake. All four of them were crushed. And my father thought it was me. And, uh, you know, it's like, it wasn't, but uh, thank God. But there were times where, you know, I was driving in the car with some people I shouldn't have been, and I could have very easily been killed because of some of the, you know, but he, I didn't, I didn't get killed. Um, yeah, there's just, you know, and just all kinds of things, you know, you, some, you wonder why some people, you know, uh, they die in a situation or they get really, you know, and then, you know, you're in a same, similar situation and you don't get touched, you know, so it could be that God was protecting you, uh, d uh during that whole time. So, uh, we should thank God. Oh, you know, we have, uh, things that illnesses, you know, you think about today, um, uh, you know, God can use doctors. Uh, you think about, I think, things like today, like, uh, you know, strep throat. When you were a kid, you had strep throat, you had uh, pneumonia or something. You know, kids used, to, in, kids used to die from that stuff. People used to die from all kinds of stuff. The flu, uh, like crazy, you know, and, and, and young people, you know, you could, as a, you know, a baby, infant mortality was wicked high. Uh, you know, women having babies. Women d died a lot of times from giving childbirth years ago. But we, in our modern age, with the, the advancement of uh, medicine and the knowledge uh, that we have now, uh, we take a lot of these things for granted. Like, uh, you know, my, my uh, I was talking to my mother, her, her father and her mother died before she was five. And one, her father died of a, I think both of them died of a stroke or a, 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 um, some kind of stroke. And I, you know, a, a lot of the stuff or a shock or something. And what happened is, you know, a lot of those things probably now we'd find out if they were living today, they wouldn't have died from those things, you know? So, you know, thank God for modern medicine and the, and the knowledge that God, that the doctors have, because God uses doctors. The doctors are not smart in themselves, so to speak. You know, they're smart, but you know what? God is the, where is all the wisdom about the human body? Who has all the wisdom in the human body? God. So the advancement of medicine is directly attributed to Jesus Christ. No doubt. Because he's the one who created the human body and knows therefore all about it. So we should thank God for all the wonderful blessings he's given to us and thank him for all the deliverances from all dangers and different things that we could have, it could have turned out badly for us. We could have died from it maybe. So we should thank God uh, for all these deliverances, because he and, and always remember that he is a God of deliverance. Not only does he, not only does he, does he deliver us from sin and Satan, eternal condemnation, and spiritual and physical death, but he also delivers us from physical danger and physical death at times. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit would encourage us with what we've heard in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's name. We pray, Amen. Okay, we'll have our prayer meeting in a few moments.